into chapter 15. Um, the chapter here is relatively, um, so I wouldn't want to say self-explanatory, but it's definitely something that, you know, we need to pay attention to. It's something that's critical for every sort of option that we have in terms of using the correct exercise types or modalities so that we can make the best decisions for our clients, for our athletes, for our, you know, potential rehab individuals who are coming out post, you know, physical therapy. So it, it's, it's really just making the best informed decision that you can based on what it is that's available to you. So obviously, equipment selection is going to be very important based on what you have in a facility. Um, if you're mobile, what do you have in your trunk? Are you having a van or whatever that you're using to go around with? You know, if you're using this inside of an athletic facility, are, you know, do you have all of these items? Do you need all of these items? So it just varies greatly depending upon what you're looking to do and what your demographics are for individuals. So the first one, obviously, um, most one of the most common besides cardio, cardiorespiratory um, equipment inside of a fitness facility is resistance training um, machines. All right, so they're usually one of the more common things that you'll find in most uh, box style um, facilities. All right, so. What are we looking at here? You know, we're looking for resistance training purposes for their modalities. It's the strength training machines that are can be they're selectorized. Uh, they can be variable depending upon what it is that you're using, what the cam or the circular pulleys or the different shaped pulleys oblong can be, which provide you a different level of um, resistance. You know, pushing through a sticking point if it's more oblong of that pulley, meaning where the wires wrap around for the cable. All right. The thing about a machine is it's pretty easy to get yourself into some trouble, but it's also really easy to set yourself up for success early on. The reason why the trouble is there is because typically individuals themselves and even trainers for that most part do not adjust the machines to the correct proportions of the person. So you have to be able to do that. Now, does it require a lot of training? No, it doesn't. Not at all. But as the person who is giving people the advice that they need and the, the assistance and the education that they need, then you as the professional need to know what to adjust, what to look for, what to make changes to, and then adapt to it, okay? Um, the other thing that gets a little tricky is that some machines just do not provide the greatest range of motion. So you gotta be very aware of that, all right? so. It's just making sure that these equipment pieces are used correctly and that individuals can understand how to adjust for the next person that uses it versus the first person that used it, okay? I do agree that it doesn't, def you know, the design sometimes does not fit all body types. Unfortunately, if you're a larger person, it's gonna be very difficult to fit into some of these apparatus, you know, the, the apparatus that's in front of you, all right? Um, it does only, because it's because machines are isolated, um, it's kind of hard sometimes to get a true compound full body motion like a deadlift or a squat in there, but not to say that you can't do compound lifts, but typically you're going to work in one plane of motion, all right, because of that isolation. And I mean, in the mo for the most part, when you're looking at resistance training with machines, you're really using this to get the strength up for individuals who lack a little bit of that stability of being able to hold on to something like a free weight. Okay, so it's really good for beginners. And like it says here, it's good for special needs clients because they may need a little bit, they may require or need a little bit more assistance to get them through the range of motion that they're trying to get through. Okay. With free, with free weights, all right, um, you know, we're talking here about um, dumbbells, then you get your barbells plus the plates that can be loaded onto them. They're, you know, definitely going to, you can isolate still, but this is definitely making it a lot easier to hit multiple groups of muscles, or you can still emphasize on a specific targeted area. Now, machines versus free weights with athletic performance, free weights have always, I shouldn't say always, it's a really harsh word, but majority of research that's out there will always, uh, majority of the research that's out there heavily influences coaches, trainers to use free weights as, an, as the best alternative 
for athletic improvements and in performance. Okay, can't use always because it's not always the case. So what's the best option? Free weights because it's it's showing that the, the improvements that come versus those with with uh, machine base is shown to be superior. So just understand that, you know, when in doubt, stick with the free weight for, for the, for an athletic performance increase. Um, it will, cha it will challenge the core stabilization system a lot greater, which is good because we want to be able to enhance not only the strength component, the hypertrophy component, but we also want to hit that, you know, core stabilization so that you can focus in on those local muscles that really require a lot of attention. Free weights do require a spotter. Not always, depending upon you know what exercise movement you're using, but for many of them, especially if they're overhead or over the body, all right, that can be you know more of a need for a spotter. So you know, do not ever shy away from that. Now, as you know, one of the things that we have to be aware of though is that with beginners, there's going to be a lot of additional support that's needed. So it may be good to introduce free weights, but understand that it may be more difficult for them. And then failure might seem a little bit easier here. So you gotta be very particular about that, okay? Now with free weights though, unlike a machine that can double up, triple up, quadruple up, et cetera, on whatever kind of weight you're trying to show improvements for, you're gonna need a multitude of dumbbells. You're gonna need um, a larger selection of barbell barbells, okay, of different sizes. And, of course, the plates that are associated with them. Depending upon the facility, you may require them to be rubber. You may require them to be metal. It, you know, it, it just it depends, all right, because you're going to have to find a way to change the load. Well, you can, for a machine, you just take the pin out and drop the pin in. With a free weight, you're going to have to either change the complete dumbbell itself or you're going to have to manipulate the, the discs or the plates that are on um, the barbell itself, all right? So uh, from here, what you can, you know, again, this, these are, again, machines different in, in the fact that cable machines can almost do everything when it comes to a complete total body, okay? Do, they do not require a spotter, but and, and the, that's cool because it's almost, a cable machine is almost like a, a combo free weight machine, all right? Because you're still freely movable. And usually one side is independent of the other, which is awesome. So you don't develop that um, that desire or that need to be able to, to dominate one side versus the other in, in a standard machine. So that's really kind of cool how you can work on that. All right, so very appropriate. Now the tubing, you know, or resistance bands, which you know sometimes we can you know lose sight of what they really are. They're still similar to what a cable machine is except what's happening is you're you're going through some sort of um transition from as you're at the lowest point to the highest point you're you're increasing the amount of resistance that's being provided so you're looking at heavier dosages of proprioception you're looking at higher amounts of joint stabilization that are needed um, and, and it's really taking you through a variable style resistance as you go through the whole thing so therefore it's going to require a little bit more muscular endurance versus if you were to use just a dumbbell or, or a machine, okay? So, you know, the, the female on the bottom picture there, she's actually complete, completing a, um, a bicep curl. Well, there's still some joint stabilization that's there because it's still kind of a free-moving item. And again, they're, they're still independent of each other, so you got to work both sides equally. So, it, like a cable machine, the, the resistance bands or tubing is still very much um, the same premise. Now, you can use tubing that has handles. You can use tubing without handles. There are, um, you can buy, it almost looks like uh, silicone scarving, but it's still, you know, there's still bands. It's just they look a little bit different, but not all require, you know, the handheld, you know, the hand the hand devices there. So, it's just something that you have to just keep paying attention to and what's most appropriate for your people. All right. Medicine ball is very applicable for high level power motions. Um, but it's something that can be used with everybody at any time. Okay. Um, like I said, it's, it's definitely for explosive motions. Now, again, explosive is different for all ability levels and all age levels. So, 
Um, it's just a way that you can manipulate certain movements with additional weight, but you're allowed to, you know, you're, you're basically allowing the body to be able to be used in multiple planes of motion for different things. All right. So one of the things that I really do, and it's in bigger, bolder letters here is if you look down at the bottom, you know, you're basically able to explode without having to decelerate. So basically you're just, you're in continuous acceleration until the end of that range or the end of that motion is done, and then you can start to slow yourself down. So that's one of the cool things about the ball is it just keeps on going until you're putting the end product out there. Um, but variants of size and style. So there are different types. You, know, you have bouncy medicine balls that when you slam on the ground, for example, they bounce back up to you. You have ones that dead bounce. You have um, different materials. You have rubber-coated outsides. You have nylon-coated outsides. They come in different sizes and shapes, so you know it just varies, uh, you know, depending upon what you're looking to do. So you have to be very aware when you're purchasing these things or you're having people use them. You know what the difference is and why you would be using one versus another. Okay, balls that dead bounce. That means you're going to have to typically squat down and pick it back up. Well, if a person is not good in their lifting, meaning like just even like if they were to lift a box up off the floor, then you got you know you might want to work on something that has a little bit more bounce so they don't bend over and hurt themselves because they don't know how to lift something up correctly off the floor. All right. Kettlebells. Now they're their own entity, but really in, in some respect, a kettlebell is a flat, a flat is a free weight. Okay. It, and I mean, it's, it, it's still similar to a dumbbell, even though the shapes are very different, but you're, you're basically looking at it from the perspective that it's just an alternative free weight that you can use to do many different things that are very similar to what a dumbbell can do, all right? Um, although, you know, just even doing multiple sets of kettlebell swings um, can really start showing, you know, some of that muscular endurance, even though it's still a pretty heavy-duty strength motion. So, you know, it, there's a lot of added benefits that, like it says here, you know, physical stamina, a mental focus because you can't lose sight of of the stabilization that's required when you're with a kettlebell the coordination that comes with the balance that comes with it even just doing um a renegade row here like this individual is doing where they're you know they're they're in a upper plank position and what they're doing is they're rowing that that kettlebell off the floor returning and then doing the opposing side or you can return and then do the same side whatever way you decide to but that taxes you in that coordination and balance department so that now you're going to work with, you know, core stabilization to make sure you're in optimal form and, and posture and position. All right. But really, you know, as opposed to just simple isolations, like you could do a row and be more isolated. This creates a little bit more um, bang for your buck where you're, you're going to be using more musculature to keep yourself in line, organized and moving correctly and efficiently. All right. Um, one of the things that you know is suggested though is that kettlebells are definitely more advanced, but like anything else, and and because they are very, as it says here, they can be used in with multiple joints and multiple planes of motion, and they are very what we would call posterior chain heavy, meaning there's an emphasis on the back side of the body. So what are we talking about predominantly there? We're talking about you know upper back, you know, so you're talking about traps down all the way through lats. You're moving through your erectors, your QL, down through your glutes and your hamstrings. We're not really going to kill the the calves on this one, but you can. You're definitely going to feel from pretty much below the neck to above the knee, and that's really in, that. You're really talking majority of the posterior side or the posterior chain of the body. So understand that when you're working with kettlebells, they're going to put it. They're going to tax that posterior side of the body. So you got to be very aware of um, what motions you're doing and not to overwhelm a person, especially depending upon their fitness level. All right. Body weight training is exactly what it sounds like. You're doing anything that you would do with any machine, with any free weight, with any kettlebell, with any medicine ball, but you're doing it without any of the additional weight. You're doing it solely with your body itself. Now, not maybe the best you know, verbiage here, but you know, when you're talking about body weight stuff, there's, you know, there's the advent of the prisoner workout, 
which is basically doing all the things that you see on the bottom there, push-ups, squats, sit-ups, pull-ups. You know, when you, you know, if you ever met somebody who has gone to prison, a lot of them have, don't have that ability to use the outdoor, the, the outside of the cell equipment, you know, for weight training or anything like that. So they have to live by the, you know, the, the push-up advent, the body weight squats without any additional weight. They'll do sit-ups and pull-ups. And then usually one of the other ones that they do is like dips where you put, they put themselves up on their bed and they dip down and, and then push back up doing more like tricep extension work. So, you know, body weight training is just as vital and, and it's still going to keep an, an ability to increase intensity. So therefore you can maintain, if not enhance muscles that may not have been going in that direction. Now suspension, suspension trainers, typically you'll hear the terminology of TRX straps um, you might rings like, like, um, like a ring that would be used for gymnastics. That's another style of suspension training. And then you also might hear, um, the jungle gym. Those are the three main ones that I work with predominantly more TRX and rings just because of the facilities that I've worked at. And really, again, with these, it's still using traditional exercises that, uh, that someone knows how to use, except now what you're doing again is you're in intensifying the joint stabilization. You're, you're in enhancing the ability of core musculature to stabilize, to stabilize the whole system. And then on top of that, you're still going to go through those ranges of motion, um, of the body. So you're going to use your body weight as the intensity. So that can also work. Now I've done different movements where you've worn a weight vest, you know, so you're adding some resistance there. I've done it where maybe you're holding on to a kettlebell or a dumbbell, all right, and you're trying to go through a range of motion that way. So it just depends on what the motion is, and you can adjust it and modify it to make it more challenging, especially for those who are more advanced, but you want to work on some of their core stabilization. So you're going to use something like a suspension trainer, all right, and, and really depending upon what motion you're doing, it's going to, we're going to be talking about you know your anchor points, which are going to be your feet and your, your legs, depending upon where they anchor to you, you know, if you're going to be doing upper body stuff, you might have your, your hands anchored to the floor and your feet inside of the suspension trainer or the ring. So it just depends on what the motion is that you're, you're, you're going to be able to then make the adjustment or fix that person in a certain way so that they can use their upper or their lower body accordingly. But it's definitely like, you know, it's definitely got the word body weight in there. So there's your, but what we're saying is your body is hanging and you're using your body weight to be able to intensify those traditional movements that you know about rows, squats, bicep curls, um, tricep extensions, shoulder, uh, shoulder or chest press. All right. So you, there's many things that you can do with it. All right. So what are we talking about in terms of why? Well, increased muscle activation. You're going to get more bang for your buck for more, you know, so you're going to call upon more motor units, more muscles that are going to become activated. There isn't as much compression on the spine. You don't have any, you don't have high levels of spinal loading. Like if you had a barbell or a dumbbell, um, it can help with increased performance. There are, you know, elite level athletes that use these consistently and constantly to help improve their performance outside of just lifting traditional weights. Um, and because you're using more muscles, because there's um, an ability to have a little bit more intensity, because there's a little bit less added weight, you're going to be able to, even though there is less added weight, you still can burn um, more calories, be a little bit more metabolically inclined. And because of that, typically you're going to work uh, a little bit more muscularly endurance based. So that can improve both, car you know, both uh, lung and heart function. So your cardiovascular health. Okay, or cardiovascular fitness. Now, one of the things that we've talked about in the balance chapter was being able to use different accessory types of um, equipment that can be used to help us to enhance different types of things. So here we're talking about proprioceptive modalities, sensory based, so that the body senses that the body is in un is unstable. So when it does that, what it's going to do is it, it has to detect how the body has to react. So stability balls, when you're sitting on it doing an overhead or a military press like you see here, not only are you working shoulders predominantly, but you're also working core musculature, you know, all the way from head to toe 
to be able to stabilize the body on the ball at the same time that you're doing a weighted movement. Okay, so what you're always thinking about is keeping the body in line, proper posture, using the right muscles to be able to actually lift the weight the right way and then stabilize the whole system to not slouch, come out of that posture or have any other additional issues that will, you know, hurt the lift more than it would be about enhancing the lift, okay? But again, what are we talking about here? Again, it's more about using core musculature to stabilize the body so that you can lift the through the motion that you're required to do and you know moving from stable to unstable okay another form of proprioceptive modalities is the bosu ball i'm sure that many of you have seen this before definitely um very very challenging i just want to go to the next slide really quick to see yep see a little bit different now the bosu on one on one hand can be used this way. All right, this is a little bit more stable. Now, if you were to flip it over and put it onto the sphere side or the squishy side, then you have a flat standing platform, but because it's round on the bottom, that changes up the intensity as well. Here, you have the flat side down, so it's stable on the bottom, but then you have the roundness on top, so you can adjust accordingly. Um, if you, so for those that were in class last week, you would have saw that when you know Raul went and squatted down, he actually started to shake a little bit because what he's doing is he's trying to recruit more muscle fibers and get that ability level to enhance because he is basically having to overcome that stabilization that's occurring in the same muscle groups. So he needs to be able to work outside of that and try to make sure that he doesn't have that occur. So the shaking is going to happen for many of us. Um, it just, you know, as you get better and the system becomes more synchronized, that's where synchronization comes into play. You can, you can s squat down and stand up safely, number one, and then more in a more coordinated manner because the body is dictating or understanding how to make the adjustments to um, work against that unstable surface. Okay. Vibration training. This was, uh, let's see. Vibration training really was a thing in the early 2010s um, when I started working for you know, the university. That was around 2012, and that was when vibration training really was a big thing. Now they have these, and they still have some of these boot, you know, the the, bo the boutique shops that do vibration training, but they're kind of diminishing and you don't see these in as much of a, um, a regular, you know, existence like they once were when they became pretty popular. So um, this is that, that machine right there is actually called a power plate. Um, I know that at major universities around the country, they were using it for um, their athletes. So what's the whole general idea here is that the vibration is causing um, the vibration causes muscles to constantly contract muscles that may not be even being used, but the muscles that are being used, it's what we would. So we talked about the word tone way back in the exercise science chapter and not like toning up your muscles. I'm talking about nervous system tone or neuromuscular tone where muscles have to stay semi-contracted to keep you in optimal alignment for posture and things like that. So what you have here is with this vibration effect, you're gonna have a higher tone level, more muscle contraction. So therefore you're gonna to have to be able to overcome that and be able to go through certain ranges of motion like this female is doing here, where she's trying to squat down and stand back up while that, that, what, that stable surface that she's standing on is vibrating. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a stable surface, but it is still a stable surface. Okay, so typically the premise behind this is that um, while working on this vibration plate is that you're, you're, because your muscles are contracting at times where they're really not supposed to be, when you put them onto a stable surface, it should be able to help with the contraction being more coordinated, more synchronized, and it's going to be able to basically have you understand that 
because you're now in a stable environment, it was harder in the unstable, so it should create an easier movement when you take yourself off of that. Um, I know that one of the facilities that I worked at, after, after people um, went through cryotherapy, we would actually have them, they didn't have the big apparatus that you see over here. It was just more of a stand-on unit, which it was like a, almost like the bottom portion here, just a little bit thinner. And uh, you stood on that, and, and basically the whole body vibration helps with blood flow. And that's another part of it too is the blood flow aspect of it. But it helps blood flow, and it helps those muscles to contract to get the blood to circulate after cryotherapy, which, you know, again, is super severely cold temperatures that your body is going up against for anywhere, you know, for uh, a cryotherapy chamber. You have it in there for three minutes. So you get done, you stand on that, and, and it's shaking. Well, as you're vibrating, the shaking, like when you shiver, okay, it's very comparable. When you shiver, what's happening is muscles start to, they're, you know, muscles are contracting when you're shivering, but it's the vibration that's almost creating the shivering of the, of the, of the body, and therefore the muscles will contract to keep up with it. So it's really a kind of a very interesting, you know, machine, but I think the research from it didn't really dictate a lot of, um, movement forward with these machines and it was showing that you know doing something on a stable environment versus on a power plate or a vibration plate wasn't really showing the improvements that i i feel like the creators thought that they would get you know and maybe their research that they did on their own indicated there was and, and there have been improvements there's definitely nothing in the research that shows that it doesn't help improve but you know again you know when you get to a certain point and you become better in shape those improvements start to diminish because you're ba you're basically able to overcome the vibration at a greater length and it's really not causing the same effect that it once did so just something to think about in that respect all right um so you know here's some of the things that I, and i do agree with you know this part right here there you know this is one of the reasons why a lot of the d1 um you know colleges around the around the country were using these is because they were using it actually for a recovery piece, which is really kind of cool. Um, the, you know, because of the muscle contraction, for some people, it's <laughs> this this power plate or excuse me, this vibration training almost reminded me of the old videos that you saw of the people who put the belts around the body and it just shook them all over the place. Um, this kind of reminds me of that, but the whole premise of that was through that vibration or that shaking. It was going to help muscles to contract to then become more metabolically influenced. And that's what we're talking about here. There is some ability to increase bone density. Um, that has shown in some research, but to the extent that I think, again, they wanted to, it may not be as high as it could be. And then um, there, is, there is some good research and evidence that has shown that there can be improvements in flexibility and, and an end range of motion. So you can actually achieve, because of the muscle contraction, and because of you don't you don't have as much of that weight bearing effect, you you can actually you're not going to get as sore, and so you're not going to end up as, with as many adhesions through, throughout the muscle fibers. So you end up having you know full range of motion, increased range of motion with that full range, and then you, because of that full range of motion plus the movements that you're doing, you know the flexibility can improve because it's going to help you be able to achieve. Um, a greater distance. And then there are, there have been some signs that can help with things like Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or fibromyalgia. So you could see if you're going to be working with, you know, um, special populations that this can definitely be something that will work for them. And then lastly, you know, when you're looking at everything, um, it, it really needs to be one of those things where with vibration training, kind of like if you were to start off with um, uh, people who want to use uh, minimalist or uh, low sole shoes, you want to start off low, low intensity, but then with the vibration stuff, it's low frequency um, and shorter sessions. And then you just build up over time. Okay. You can go heavier on the intensity. You can go a little bit longer with the duration. You can put different training mechanisms in there. You can put different movements in there to make it a little bit more challenging. Try if you ever get to be around one, um, you know, definitely give it a try and try to do ten push-ups on it. It's very challenging, you know, with just doing ten push-ups with your hands on that power plate. So, 
um, you know, give it a try if you get the chance and, and see what it does and what the stimulus really is that gets you. Okay. So, but that, this is one of the things that I was saying before is that once you become adapted to, um, a specific stimulus like vibration, there, there needs to be some sort of change that occurs to offset what's already been progressed upon. And then eventually maybe you can go back to it when things need a little bit more, um, you know, maybe to go back to the original starting point, or maybe you just need to create a little bit of change for the next program. And this might be the way to do it. So definitely consider that. But again, you know, this is really a not so bad chapter because it's really just understanding what you're using, what the modalities are, what different types there are that are out there. Because then when you go back to like chapter 14 and you look at the programming, it's like, okay, well, do I want to use a machine here? Do I want to use a free weight? Do I even have free weights? Do I even have machines? Do I have kettlebells? Do I have BOSU balls? Do I need to use any of them? So it's just, you start playing the mind game with yourself of how can I make this engaging? How can I make this so that a person's going to want to come back and work out with me again? And, and, and how do I make it more differentiated and variable so that, you know, everybody who is, everybody who's using it, they understand like, oh, okay, well, this was fun. You know, this was exciting. This is something new and challenging. So, um, you know, definitely take that into consideration. Now, this is just hitting on a spectrum of things. Um, obviously, there are things that we can use with the SAQ. Um, and plyometrics, but this is more about, this is more getting into like the resistance training, the plotting of everything. So um, definitely take everything with a grain of salt here because yes, we can use other things like a box or things like that, but we're talking about specifics just for the resistance training component. Okay. So other than that, that's chapter 15, pretty short and sweet um, for the most part for these videos. So we will see where this takes us. So um, have a great day and we'll get to chapter 16 soon. Take care.